I'd like to tell you something crazy. A few years ago, I convinced my husband, Stefan, to do a 130-kilometer pilgrimage to Vatican City in July. I think of myself as a decent human being, but I must have been an evil sinner in a past life because this walk for me was a descent into Dante's ninth circle of hell. You can't see it, but it's 35 degrees Celsius. My back had open blisters from my backpack. My feet were so swollen, I had sacrificed two toenails to St. Peter. And so I am mature, I'm 32 years old, but I throw down my backpack, I sit down on the gravel road, I take off my hiking boots, and I say to my husband, I am done. And this is why Stefan says today, he's glad it was my idea and not his. <laughs> because if it were his idea, we would not be married right now. <laughs> but on that hot day, my calm husband, annoyingly blister-free, with all 10 toenails intact, told me, look, we can take a taxi to Vatican City, no one is going to know we didn't finish this thing on foot, and no one will care. Or I can take your backpack, you can take my flip-flops. Let's just get this thing done. Remember why you wanted to do this thing. And as you can probably imagine, we chose the harder route. So you can see Saint Stefan carrying two backpacks. And here's me in my flip-flops, and I'm this pathetic creature hobbling like Gollum in Lord of the Rings, in my flip-flops, but we make it to Vatican City. We get our pilgrim certificates, and I shower, and I treat my eight remaining toenails to a pedicure. <laughs> now, you know me as a pilgrim, but I'd like to tell you what compelled me to do this crazy walk. And to do that, I need an outfit change, please. So you see, this simple white coat was worth every step. I walked to donate money to my medical residency, and this is the white coat I wore for three years, over 70 hours a week. It ain't haute couture, but it did cost me $300,000 in student loan debt. And it is my favorite piece of clothing. And my residency was at a Harvard teaching hospital. It was very special because it was mandated to serve the disenfranchised members of society, the people you don't really think about, the people you don't see, the asylum seeker who got off the plane from Haiti and showed up at the emergency room with sepsis, overwhelming infection from stage four lung cancer, the schizophrenic who called the salt pile under the bridge home. And I'll never forget how one patient left against my medical advice, he bolted from the intensive care unit like he was breaking out of prison. He was more scared by the potential loss of his grocery cart of belongings than the very likely loss of his life. And so I walked to honor those who had no choice but to endure walking a road paved with suffering. But at the end, this pilgrimage became so much more than a walk of service. Because with every step, it was imprinting on me a medical metric that would fundamentally change my concept of medicine. I call it the biological footprint. And without exaggerating, the biological footprint would become the best prescription for mitigating my patient's suffering. So what is it? We've all heard of the carbon footprint, right? It measures the impact of our actions on climate change. And the biological footprint is a metric of how the actions we take to improve our health impacts not just ourselves, but improves society beyond ourselves. And we can track it, just like we track steps on a Fitbit. And as we do so, it establishes our agency over our inherited suffering, and it holds us accountable for our well-being and those of our communities. This is really important, because our health is actually our most valuable, precious resource. Too often, we take it for granted, until bad luck steals it, or carelessness squanders it. So I think of it as the best insurance policy against the suffering we experience. But why am I depressing all of you by talking about suffering? It's because
because we all inherit a part of suffering. The ancient Greeks, they knew what they were doing when they came up with the word pathogen to mean cause of disease. Pathos meaning suffering, gen meaning birth. So you have suffering and birth intertwined, forever linked in the double helix of DNA, passed from one generation to the next. And this predetermined inheritance from the genetic wheel of fortune, it spares no one. So whether you live from the streets or in a villa, suffering is the universal tax collector. It will always come calling. But I'm sure you notice that people approach suffering differently. So some people view themselves as doomed to be prisoners of circumstance and bad luck. And other people, despite having greater suffering, they have a different outlook. They're not blind or ignorant to the reality of their suffering, but they kind of move proactively in the direction of a better future. So I ask you, what group would you rather belong to? I'd like to introduce you to the two patients that ultimately inspired the biological footprint, that embodied the suffering that comes from tragic medical illness and circumstance, but with two drastically different outcomes. But disclaimer, these two patients are not examples of my success as a doctor. There are two instances I felt I epically failed. And let me tell you, it's a horrible feeling to have as a doctor when you fail. It's like that vomit that comes up to your throat and it's hot and it's uncomfortable. But I will always be grateful for that feeling because that failure gave birth to this idea that would guide my future successes. So I'd like to introduce you to my first patient, whom I will call Harold, not his name a 67-year-old man with no permanent address. And you can imagine that Harold has charcoal black lungs from years of smoking. He has nasal prongs to give him oxygen. His blood vessels are clogged pipes of cholesterol, and his heart is this weak little pump, just completely useless from multiple heart attacks. And Harold is a challenging patient because he often disappears for long periods of time as he crashes on three sofas in three faraway towns. He's a nice guy, but kind of like that first date that goes really well and then he ghosts you without warning. And so you're left like this desperate teenager to call him like, Harold, it's your doctor. It was really nice to meet you. Can we make a plan to get together? Please call me back. And I prepare a detailed plan to manage his complex conditions and I enter the room to meet him. And here's Harold. His prothesis look like they're gonna fall out of the stumps where his legs used to be. And he's kind of sitting hunched like he doesn't wanna meet my gaze, as if he's brought all the weight of his medical records to the appointment. I introduce myself as his new doctor and I attempt to reconcile Harold who's in front of me with Harold who I spent hours reading about. And so I ask him, Harold, so how's it going? How's your sugar, your blood pressure? Are you taking your inhaler? Are you trying to quit smoking? I'm gonna stop you right there. You seem like a nice lady, and I've met many of you young doctors. You all try to help, and I, I know that. But stop. Look, I don't have a wife, I don't have kids, I don't have a job, I live off disability checks. I am ready to die, so you don't have to keep trying to save me. And I feel the hot tears coming, and this white coat is three sizes too big for me. And I ask him, Harold, why? I wonder, why are you embracing your suffering? He reminds me of the Greek god Sisyphus, you know, the one who's resigned to the destiny of pushing boulders up the hill, only to have them crush him back down. And if I'm honest, yes, Harold's rejection of my effort and my knowledge, it does sting my ego, but more crucially, my perception of how to help Harold is apparently totally off. So feeling very conflicted, I consulted with my mentor, who perceptively mentioned to me, look, something, someone keeps Harold driving from place to place. Maybe it's the friends who give him the sofa to sleep on. You just didn't find out. Try to find out next time. My mentor had successfully verbalized Harold's biological footprint, but I never got the chance to ask him because months later, I heard that Harold had a devastating bleed in his brain from the uncontrolled blood pressure he neglected. 
He was no longer free to drive, no longer free to see his friends, and his maimed body and mind would decay in a nursing room bed until his death. And so I ask you, was Harold's outcome my fault? I think most people would say no, but his visit could have been a plea for a different kind of medicine. And in my ignorance, I stuck to traditional guidelines instead of exploring the biological footprint that could have saved both of us. But if Harold's story was an unrealized biological footprint, my second patient, who I'll call Andy, again, not his real name, gave me hope for its transformative power. So now it's months later, and I'm working in this addiction clinic across town. And I'll be very honest with you, I would rather treat stage four cancer than addiction. It scares me because it is so hard to treat. Maybe you know someone who's choked by the vice of addiction, so you also know how difficult it is to break free. Andy's 35, he's just a few years older than me, and he's kind of playing with the Christian cross on his necklace. And when he moves, I see the track marks beneath his shirt sleeves that betray his heroin addiction and his secret shame. And so I start and I ask Andy my scheduled questions. So Andy, have you been taking your medicine? Yeah. Missed any doses? No. Any side effects? No. Have there been any instances where you consumed or injected a substance? No. Really? Well, it felt too good to be true, but would Andy be my first success story? So I turn to him and I say, Andy, this is great. The medicine, the program, it's really working for you. Good job. But then Andy turns to me and says, look, doc, you don't get it. I love heroin. They caught me using at work and I got fired. I couldn't pay my rent because it cost me 500 bucks a week. Yeah, I'm doing all your steps. But the only thing that got me to stop was my dog, Henry. Because I realized if I overdosed, no one would take care of him. But trust me, if there wasn't a Henry, I'd go out there right now and buy a gram and shoot up right in front of you. So I realized that Andy's success, despite his love for heroin, was due to the realization of his biological footprint. Because each small choice, from the medicine that curbed his cravings to attending recovery meetings, had a measurable impact on little Henry's survival. So indeed, it was Henry's role in Andy's biological footprint that kept Andy sober. And to all of you, here's my prescription to keep you going beyond the suffering you're struggling with. Identify your unique biological footprint. Ask yourself what or who benefits from you living a healthier life despite or because of the suffering you inherit. And I know you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you just didn't have the words. Because you all know that woman. She's the one with the permanent cigarette between her fingers, but the minute she gets pregnant, she quits smoking. And you think that's love or maternal instinct? It's not, it's the footprint. And I get it because I haven't had unpasteurized cheese in eight months. <laughs> or Philip, you all have a Philip. Philip is your uncle, he's your elderly neighbor. His hands are gnarled like a Disney villain from arthritis, and you've never seen him stand up straight. He's always like this after failed back surgery. But you drive Philip to the doctor to get refills on his pain medicines that he pops like candy. And he hates his doctor who tells him, Philip, try to do some exercise. It really helps with chronic pain. But Philip has tomato plants, and they need him. And when Philip is in the garden, he's kind of stretching, and he's lunging, and he's squatting. And he has that beautiful mobility and flexibility that you only see in youth, the things that age steals. And you want to say to him, Philip, don't ever stop gardening, because when you're gardening, you're exercising. When you're exercising, you're not in pain. And here's another question for you. Do you want to spare your children and your grandchildren the trauma of reliving your trauma on a therapist's couch? Maybe, just maybe, if you think of them first instead of yourself, but through your self-awareness and efforts, you realize you might finally break the curse of intergenerational trauma that everyone else in your family had to unfairly endure. 
And by saving your family, you ultimately saved yourself. So the biological footprint we seek to manifest is our tool against succumbing to our inevitable suffering and unjust health outcomes. And I ask you, once you identify, tell your doctor. It should be very prominent in your care plan. It's my greatest desire that the footprint serves as the foundation of your autonomy and dignity. It is the best advocacy for your life, the value you bring through your existence, the legacy you choose to leave behind. And you might say, oh, come on, that's for people who lack motivation. But remember, motivation is finite. It can abandon you just as it abandoned me, despite my every good intention, eight kilometers from my goal. And I needed my husband to finally remind me. Because when motivation and love fails, the biological footprint will triumph because impact always triumphs. And when doctors and patients partner to actualize it, I imagine it will drive positive societal change. I think of it like David's slingshot. It's aimed against the Goliath four and a half trillion dollar medical industrial complex. And I'm telling you, I need a medicine that is profoundly effective, extremely simple. Because every day at work, I am paralyzed in this tug of war of equal and opposite emotions. There's my medical duty to save you. There's my desire to go home and see my daughter. There's my wish to hear all of your worries today. There's my need to speed it up because we only have 15 minutes, we're an hour late, and they're getting angry at me. And so when I feel so frustrated, and I think I should quit and just be an extra on Grey's Anatomy because they all look really good in their outfits, and I'm feeling and looking like the hamster on the wheel, I remember the oath I took when I accepted this white coat, the oath that embodies the biological footprint. It goes like this. I solemnly pledge myself to the service of humanity. The health and well-being of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the autonomy and dignity of my patient. And to all my patients, to all of you, I ask you to pledge to yourselves and to us to manifest your biological footprint. So if you stumble, if you feel you cannot walk another step, your body is broken, your spirit is shattered, just remind us of where you're going and why. We'll take your backpack, we'll give you another pair of shoes, and we'll walk together so you never feel alone. Thank you.